When I took the job to host this show, I never thought I'd get so wrapped up in my work. Bruno, you can let me go now. Bruno! Bruno! <laughs> if he falls on me, I'm gonna kill him. The world wrestling champion, Bruno wrestling's greatest champion. It wasn't an easy road for you getting there, though, Bruno, was it? You had a very tough childhood, huh? Yes, I did, Tom. Uh, I was born in a little town in Italy, and uh, when I was born, actually, I was a big kid. I weighed over 12 pounds, but uh, when I was very young, you know, the war broke, and we were driven into the mountains, and, uh, of course, this caused uh, a lot of sicknesses, starvation yeah. for many, yeah. and uh, we were among the few that were lucky and survived, and it was because of this that I... Like a lot of people couldn't believe that Bruno at one time was a, yeah. a, a, a you know, legitimate 80-pound weakling, but it uh, was because of this uh, starvation period that we went through. Great stories I've read about you eating snow and dandelions and stuff to stay well, alive. That's how we survived. Uh, I remember many days where you just filled your stomach with, uh, with snow, yeah. and in the spring, dandelions, grass, uh, anything. What made you interested in wrestling? Wrestling was always the, 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 my goal, uh -huh. but I needed something that was going to give me size and strength, uh -huh. which I lacked. So I took up uh, both Olympic lifting and power lifting, and like I say, its main purpose was, of course, to increase in size. But um, the goal was never to, to make it uh, the thing in my life. The uh -huh. thing in my life was, again, was always preparing for wrestling, because that was my goal. As big as you were, you'd have been a pretty good tackle on a professional football team. You well, actually got an offer, didn't yes, you? Yes, uh, Rudy Jr., the, the guy, who, what do you call it, that goes around looking for new talent. Uh -huh. Scouts and things. Scouts, right, right yeah, Scott. He, he approached me to uh, to take a tryout what for the Steelers. This is the Pittsburgh Steelers. But at the time, I had turned pro. And at that time, too, uh, Tom, this is uh, going way back where alignment was like good for maybe 10000 a year. Yeah. Whereas uh, my rookie years, or wrestler, I was doing quite a bit more than that, yeah. say between thirty and 40000 yeah. And that's how it started. In 1960, Bruno Sammartino joins the world of professional wrestling. Though relatively small for his sport, the six-foot grappler from Abruzzi, Italy, parlays his great strength and athletic ability into early success on the canvas. It's Gorilla Monsoon against Bruno Sammartino. Monsoon, the 400-pounder, against the extraordinary abilities and strength of Bruno Sammartino. Sammartino with the bear hug, squeezing for all these words. Sammartino noted for his incredible strength as witnessed by the body slam. Sammartino continuing to move in on Gorilla Monsoon, another tremendous body slam. The fans behind the young Bruno Sammartino all the way. Bruno pouring it on now against Monsoon. Bruno Sammartino with his toughest test to date against this giant of a man. Popping blows now with Gorilla Monsoon. Monsoon then again down on the canvas. Sammartino going for the cover. Still, all is not easy for Bruno Sammartino. 
With a grueling schedule of five bouts a week, he's left bruised and battered by the constant punishment of his sport. The first few years were a little rough, Tom, because I, I came into a world that, that really was awfully strange to me, right. and uh, I was always a sort of a naive type guy. I believed easily in people, and so I had some people direct me in the wrong ways, financially, that right. is, and so the first, uh, I guess, four years were really disastrous to me, but it was, uh, was really a well worth education because it right. really taught me a lot. What was the competition like the first couple of years? Well, the competition was okay, but the worst part was trying to, to get your name established, trying to do something to where people would know you and promoters would, uh, would give you a break, right. you know, so to speak. And mine came, of course, when uh, 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 Paul Anderson had tried to lift Calhoun, and he had failed. Nobody right. had ever lifted Calhoun, and I had said uh, uh, once that if I'd been given the opportunity that I would lift him. And, of course, a lot of people wrote in and so forth and so on, and before I knew it, there was a demand for this right. bout. Right. And when this match was made, everybody wanted to see this young guy from Italy who claims he could pick up Calhoun. He weighed about 620 pounds at the time. <laughs> and uh, when I did pick him up, uh, I thought the roof in the garden was going to pop out. Uh, and uh, when I dumped him, the whole ring even came down. <laughs> but after that, people couldn't remember my name, but they knew me as that strong man from Abruzzi, Italy. <laughs> But it was from there that things really got better for me. In 1963, you earned a shot at the title, and it must have been a big moment for you. I was wrestling through Canada at that time, and I had won the Canadian uh, heavyweight wrestling title. And from there, uh, I was given a chance at the title against Buddy Rogers. May 17, 1963, World Championship Wrestling. Bruno Sammartino challenging the champion, Buddy Rogers. Sammartino attacking from the opening bell. He's got Rogers in the air. Rogers in tremendous pain. San Martino with a crushing bear hook. Now San Martino rolling Rogers over his shoulder. He's got him in the pack breaker. Buddy Rogers is totally helpless, and it's all over. San Martino wins in 55 seconds. A stunning defeat for Buddy Rogers, and Bruno San Martino is the new world champion of wrestling. I used uh, what uh, we call a backbreaker. I just threw him over my shoulder. I hooked his neck in his leg, and I bent him the wrong way till he said I quit. <laughs> break his back, did you? Well, actually, we did. He got oh. damaged in two discs. That, 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 right? that really ended his career. He didn't wrestle much oh. after that. Why don't we go to the spa, and I'll, I'll show you a couple oh, boy. things. What do you think? Well, we'll see. <laughs> I feel has been extremely unfair to my, to my profession. Some of the critics that we get, we deserve, no right. question about it. But when they look at professional wrestling, to them it's something to kick around, to make fun of, to ridicule. But I say that we have athletes in my profession are every bit as great in athletic skills as any other athlete in any other field. Why all the gimmicks in the game of wrestling? I've always been against that, Tom, and I've always uh, fought against it because it all goes back on the success of Gorgeous George. In the 1940s, George Wagner adds a new wrinkle to professional wrestling. Performing with such luminaries as Bob Hope and Burt Lancaster, Gorgeous George attracts considerable public attention and gives his sport a striking new image.
George of George became such a tremendous success that many figure, you know, a, a why not if it's going to help my name get up to that ladder that much quicker. Irish Pat Barrett, his tag team partner, the country boy, 600 pounds of Haystacks Calhoun. Superstar Billy Graham, stepping into the squared circle, accompanied by his tag team partner, the Russian bear, Ivan Kolov. The Sheik. Handsome Jimmy Valiant. His tag team partner, his brother, luscious Johnny Valiant. The pride of Pawhusko, Oklahoma, Chief Jay Strongbow. I have never been in favor of any of these things, Tom, and unfortunately, they, they, a lot of them use these things because they feel that it's a way of being noticed, it's a way of, of getting attention, it's a way of having people right. write in about them. Recognition, bottom. right? Recognition. Unfortunately, of course, all they're doing is bringing more criticism to the game because especially the media, when they look at this individual, they never bother to look if he has ability beside gimmick. They'll only look and, mm -hmm. and spend time talking about the gimmick and the gimmick only. Bruno, why are most of the matches set up as a good guy versus the bad guy? Well, Tom, simply because promoters who, who run these big arenas around the country, they want box office success. And when they have tried the uh, scientific wrestler versus scientific wrestlers, people just don't buy tickets. Uh -huh. And they are not in the business to lose money, they're in the business to make money. Many critics of the game of wrestling have said that what's wrong with it is that the winners, in many cases, are predetermined. Is that true? I am not going to tell you that uh, this has probably never happened, or that it isn't happening, or won't happen in the future. But I can tell you this, that most of the wrestlers that I know, they know that in order to be a money maker and a success you have to be a winner and if you accept such deals that bribes of that nature you may make a, a, a good dollar today but you will pay twice that price tomorrow because you will be affected by that loss so as a rule the top-notch guys will not do businesses a lot of people seem to want to believe that they do they absolutely do not <laughs> Throughout the 1960s, one man stands supreme in the world of pro wrestling. Year after year, Bruno Sammartino defends his championship belt while building one of the largest followings in all of sports. Attracting more than two million fans annually, Bruno Sammartino is the most popular champ in the sport's history. Another capacity crowd on hand to see... Maniac, really, I had as much as 250 bouts in, in a year. It was really, really hard, and sometimes uh, you, you were really almost fed up and disgusted with it all. But then the rewards were really great, right. beside the financial rewards. I, I, for example, I had that, uh, a private audience with Pope Paul. Right. I, I met presidents uh, uh, of different countries. Right. And the fans, everywhere you go, were, they when they received... You, you, they idolized you, didn't they? Yeah, they treated me fantastic, and that was a feeling that made all the, uh, the other things really worthwhile because no matter how if you were hurt or how tired or when you saw the fans respond to you as they did it made everything well and uh, I, I loved it Bruno as a champion you you had no gimmick but you were you were the most popular wrestler of all but no gimmick to, to attract attract the fans. Why were you the most popular? Well, I, I hope, Tom, it's because people saw me as I am and they believed in my uh, skills, my abilities in the game, and I like to believe that they appreciated that and they supported me because of it. You think it was your honesty that you had in the ring and your approach to wrestling? Yeah, and also things that I had done to convince people of not only my ability but my strength, and they believed in me, and mm -hmm. I think that's why. During this period, you and Ali were two of the biggest single-name draws in sport and you almost had a chance where you were going to fight Ali. What would have happened if you got in the ring with Muhammad Ali? Well, Tom, there's no doubt in my mind, and I doubt very much if there's any doubt in his mind, that I could whip him without any problems. If you got your hands on him, it'd be no contest, right? And I would get my hands on him. 
all through your career, you had tremendous injuries and things like that. But still, you wrestled with you yeah, know, having those injuries. That's one of the problems in my profession, Tom. Because if you're at the time, San Martino's the champion. If they advertise San Martino versus so and so in Madison Square Garden, people bought a ticket to see that. So the promoters felt that if they would have put a substitution in, then people are going to ask for a refund for their ticket. It would affect the game and the gate as a whole. So you had to learn to go in there. I've done it with cracked ribs. I've done it with broken fingers. I did it with uh, uh, shoulder uh, problems. You know, you, you learn to live with it because you know you have to do it. Defending his title against all covers, Bruno San Martino is subjected to all forms of savagery. Violent world of pro wrestling, even the champ faces the constant threat of serious injury. Dan Hansen belting Bruno San Martino across the forehead once again. San Martino, neck first down to the canvas. I broke my neck. I, I broke the sixth cervical vertebrae and I yeah. dislocated the, the third, I believe. And uh, that was it. It was uh, the most serious injury because the doctors told me in Pittsburgh that I came within a millimeter of being paralyzed from the neck down. So that was by far the worst injury that I ever had. Even with all those injuries, though, after a couple years, you came back and started wrestling again. I took a whole year with my good friend doctors in Pittsburgh where were through their advice and, and therapy and right. so forth. And I started back very gradually and really, to my surprise, because I had been training every day, uh, I found that really my timing, everything was still there. Bruno San Martino returns to the ring with a vengeance. Fully recovered from his broken neck, the Italian strong boy displays his unique power and quickness as he devastates one opponent after another. by establishing himself as pro wrestling's greatest champion. And incredibly through your career, a tremendous career, you held, you held the title a total of 12 years. You must feel very proud about that. Well, I, yes, I was, Tom. 12 years was the longest that anybody ever held it in the history of the game, so I was very, very, very happy with it and very grateful, really, that I had mm -hmm. such luck. You know, that little uh, exhibition and that little uh, lesson I gave you this morning, you must be a little bit st stiff and sore. Huh? I'll never forget it. You need a little hot bath. Oh, boy, right? could I. <laughs> Here is a list of some of the other athletes who are available on Greatest Sports Legends video. Johnny Unitas, perhaps the greatest quarterback ever to play in the NFL. He once threw touchdown passes in 47 straight games. Bart Starr, quarterback, Green Bay Packers. He led the Packers to five NFL titles and two Super Bowl victories. Wilt Chamberlain's tremendous physical talent enabled him to dominate the game of basketball like never before. Wilt was the giant among giants. Bill Russell, leader of the Boston Celtics. His specialty, defense. In 13 seasons, Russell led the Celtics to 11 NBA titles. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar brought a new dimension to the center position. His fluid moves and soft touch enabled him to score at will and become the NBA's all-time leading scorer. Julius Irving has soared over, around, and through defenders with a free-floating ease that defies all laws of gravity. 
Every one of his moves is an original. Breaking 40 seconds straight game is down to his last at bat. Fred Anderson's pitch. Face hit. Joe DiMaggio has done it. DiMaggio has done it. The crowd has gone wild. 42 straight game. Here's the pitch to the Long drive to deep right field. That ball's in the upper deck. What a blast. Mickey Mantle has just hit his 16th World Series home run. That brings Babe Ruth back in the 15 and all. Smoking Joe Frazier, one of boxing's most popular champions. Frazier stalked his opponents with savage fury. Frazier's best punch is the left hook. He makes good use of it. And Ellis is down again. And the count reaches two on the bell ring. He... Larry Holmes became the heavyweight champ in 1978. And he has dominated the division ever since. Jimmy Connors, five-time U.S. Open champion. His talent is only exceeded by his tremendous competitive spirit. Bjorn Borg's subdued approach to tennis was no less effective. Borg won an amazing five straight Wimbledon titles in his career. Phil Esposito led the Boston Bruins to two Stanley Cup championships. He finished his career as the second leading scorer in hockey history. Arnold Palmer, four-time winner of the Masters Tournament. Arnie, now for a birdie. He made it. What a way to finish. A final round, nine. And oh, is he ever happy. The old master, Arnold Palmer, has beaten the reigning king, Jack Nichols. Slamming Sammy Sneed. Some golfing experts consider Snead to be the greatest natural golfer of all time. His career spanned five decades, and he won three Masters tournaments along the way. Jesse Owens captured the attention of the world with his performance in the 1936 Berlin Olympics. He won four gold medals and shattered Hitler's myth of Aryan supremacy. The name Pele is recognized all over the world. He was the greatest soccer player in history. He was also the sport's greatest goodwill ambassador. His fans were the most loyal and passionate in all of sports. 
greatest sports legends video where the legends live on.